My name is Jeremy Grace, and my colleagues and I from IDEX Health and Science, West Henrietta, New York, are happy to present this talk on using optical interference filters to measure autofluorescence in substrates and coatings. And my email address is at the bottom of this slide if you would like to contact me after this presentation. In this talk, I'll discuss the underlying motivation for the measurements, unwanted fluorescence. I'll discuss the experimental approach to this high sensitivity measurement of autofluorescence, including details about the measurement geometry, the detection scheme, and the use of high performance optical filters. And then I'll present results first on the system sensitivity and then comparisons of autofluorescence in different materials. I'll then discuss some different configurations for measuring bulk autofluorescence or autofluorescence from coatings or fluorescence from buried interfaces, and then I'll make some concluding remarks. In fluorescence microscopy, fluorophores are used to provide image contrast. <clears throat> These fluorophores absorb light and they become excited and then they emit or fluoresce at higher wavelengths. In a typical system, an excitation filter will define the wavelength range over which the excitation will occur, and an emission filter will define the wavelength range over which the fluorescence is being detected, and a dichroic beam splitter will reflect the excitation light and transmit the emission light. In the schematic of the microscope shown here, we have a light source passing through some optics, then through an excitation filter reflecting off a dichroic beam splitter focused down onto a sample. The sample fluoresces. That objective then collects light, passes it through the dichroic beam splitter. The fluorescence then passes through the emission filter, through some optics, and onto a detector. The image shown here is a sample image from fluorescence microscopy, and it's one of mouse prostate vasculature. The signal's produced by a fluorescein dye that tags mouse antibodies. And there's uh, enzyme activity, uh, and this compound NADPH is actually fluorescent, and it's involved in that enzyme activity and produces a background that reduces the signal to noise. I should mention further that optics can fluoresce, lenses and filters, and they also can affect the ultimate signal to noise performance. So how does one measure autofluorescence in lenses and filters? Our experimental approach focuses on two key things. First, the measurement geometry, and second, the detection scheme. The measurement geometry is set up to minimize the impact of scattered light. In our case, we have a diode laser. We shine it through an exciter filter. We then pass the beam through a chopper and then onto an input lens. The input lens focuses that beam onto the surface of a sample, and the excitation is at oblique angle so that the reflected ray uh, does not make it into the detection path. On the detection path, we have a microscope objective, which is focused on the surface of the sample, and then the light coming through that objective passes through an emitter filter and onto a detector. So the oblique incidence helps minimize scattered light getting into the detection path. The use of an emission filter that blocks heavily at the excitation wavelengths um, eliminates any further scatter that might end up in the detection path. And then there are low reflection baffles, not shown here, but you have to have some kind of low reflection baffles to manage the reflected light in the setup. Our detection scheme employs a high gain preamp and phase lock detection. In other words, a lock and amplifier with a chopper reference signal. Our detector is a silicon photodiode. Typical photocurrents, our picoamps are higher. The photocurrent is passed through a trans impedance amplifier and boosted by a gain of 10 to the fourth to 10 to the ninth volts per amp. The boosted signal goes to the input channel of the lock and amplifier. The chopper electronics put out a reference signal that drives the reference channel of the lock and amp. The exciter and emitter filters used in this work are high performance optical filters from Semrock. Uh, 
The exciter is the FF01-37852 with a center wavelength of 378 nanometers, bandwidth of 52 nanometers. The emitter filter is the FF01-505119 with a center wavelength of 505 nanometers and a bandwidth of 119 nanometers. These filters have nice deep edges and importantly, they have deep blocking. The optical density plots shown here for the exciter and emitter uh, demonstrate the out of band blocking in excess of OD6 down into the UV and out into the NIR for both filters. One can trade off signal for spectral information by using a narrower band emitter filter. So there'll be less total light collected, but it will come from a more well-defined spectral region. One could imagine a series of say 20 nanometer wide emitter filters spaced apart across this passband or maybe going beyond the edge of this FF01505119. Here are some initial results from this system. The results are for a two millimeter thick plastic slide. We call a DAPI slide. It's embedded with material that simulates the fluorescence from this DAPI fluorophore. The full name for the DAPI fluorophore is shown here below. Data are also shown for a one millimeter thick microscope slide and a 0.2 millimeter thick cover slip. The uh, plot shows photodiode current against excitation lens position. That lens focuses the beam down on the sample surface and it's translated normal to the detection optics axis. And as the spot translates into the field of view of the objective, the signal increases. And as it continues to translate and then leaves the field of view, the signal decreases. On this scale, the signal from the microscope slide and the cover slip are not discernible. When the same data are plotted on a logarithmic axis, one does see that the microscope slide and the cover slip do fluoresce just at much lower levels than the DAPI slide. One can determine the system sensitivity with a setup shown in schematic here. We take the laser diode and we shine it through the exciter filter, through the chopper, and through a neutral density filter of density one and right onto the detector. The diode puts out 4.5 milliwatts at 405 nanometers. The neutral density filter has an optical density of one. The detected signal is 355 millivolts on the lock-in using a trans impedance amplifier gain of 10 to the fourth volts per amp. And working through all those numbers, one determines that a picowatt of optical power corresponds to 0 0.08 picoamps. And indeed, when we have tested this setup on other samples, in this case, the cover slip is the most strongly emitting sample. One sees that we are clearly capable of detecting 0 0.1, 0 0.08 picoamps of signal clear of a lower background. The two lower fluorescing samples are three millimeter thick low autofluorescence fused silica and 0.2 millimeter thick optical grade fused silica. Here are some comparative results for a bunch of samples. We plot the peak photocurrent for a one millimeter thick microscope slide and a 0.2 millimeter thick cover slip. Assuming they're both made out of the same kind of soda lime glass, the signal ratio is consistent with their thickness ratio, suggesting the sampling depth of the measurement is at least a millimeter thick. Moving on to the three millimeter thick fused silica, that's low autofluorescence grade fused silica. We see that that is a much lower fluorescing material given how thick it is and how low the signal is relative to the others. And then we have 0.2 millimeter thick optical grade fused silica that uh, is not quite as good as this three millimeter low autofluorescence sample. On the right, we have anti-reflection coated blanks one and two. ACB1 front surface is coated with an anti-reflection coating. Both surfaces are polished. ACB2, the front polished surface is coated with an anti-reflection coating, but the rear surface is rough ground. Looking at ACB1, when the front coated surface is excited, the signal's stronger than when the rear uncoated surface is excited. That glass is two millimeter thick. 
And so these results suggest that the anti-reflection coating is more fluorescent than the glass and that the sampling depth of the measurement is less than two millimeters. So we believe the sampling depth of the setup to be somewhere between one and two millimeters. Moving on to this anti-reflection coat of blank number two, the presence of that rough ground surface, even though we're exciting just the AR coating, creates a huge boost in signal. That rough ground surface scatters the laser light, the excitation light, and the fluorescence it produces. And it underscores the importance in managing scattering in the measurement and uh, the importance of using a, a good emitter filter to block the excitation light. The system can be configured for different purposes. For example, thick samples and unfocused laser beams, collimated, can be used to detect bulk autofluorescence. If thick enough samples are available, one can expand the laser beam to fill the sample and set up the detector to detect as much fluorescence as possible. For measuring fluorescence from thin films and coatings, it's important to focus the excitation light, in this case the laser, down onto the coated surface and set the detection optics up so that the combination of the focused laser beam and the detection optics uh, provide a limited sampling depth for the measurement because you want to maximize the signal, the fluorescent signal, from the coated region of the sample. One can also illuminate from the rear and focus the beam at different planes within the sample to look at, say, a buried interface. And one can also arrange the detection optics to be looking at a particular depth. Here are some results for a sample configuration like the last one I showed you, except that the excitation beam is focused beyond the front surface of the sample, giving this measurement a little more sampling depth. The fluorescence signal in millivolts is plotted against sample thickness for two different excitation sources, a 525 nanometer laser and a 449 nanometer laser. Both of these have output powers in the range 70 to 80 milliwatts. And these cover slips are made out of display glass. They're 0.7 to 0.8 millimeters thick. And the sample thickness is obtained by stacking multiple cover slips. And from the results, one sees that the sampling depth of the measurement is somewhere between three and four millimeters, as that's where the signal levels off. In conclusion, autofluorescence generated in optical components can limit the signal to noise ratio in fluorescence microscopy and other measurement and imaging techniques. We've demonstrated the use of high performance optical filters in combination with sensitive detection electronics to detect and measure low levels of autofluorescence. Further characterization of that autofluorescence is possible using appropriate light sources and exciter filters to define the excitation wavelengths and trading off overall signal for spectral information about the emission using a series of emitter filters of narrower bandwidths and varying center wavelengths. The excitation and detection optics can be configured to measure autofluorescence from bulk substrates, coatings, or buried interfaces with sensitivity down to picowatts of optical power. And finally, it's possible to model systems and determine what components what optical elements are most critical in generating the autofluorescence. And combining that kind of analysis with autofluorescence measurements on bulk materials can be helpful in selecting or qualifying materials for an optical system. Thank you for your time. If you have access to this presentation after this talk, these references might provide some helpful background.